All right, as I mentioned last week, we're going to be going through a lot of very fundamental doctrines. So every service is going to be important. I encourage you to stick around for the, for the evening service if you can. Uh, I was kind of going back and forth between which sermon I wanted to preach in the morning and which sermon I wanted to preach in the evening, just because they're both extremely important. This morning, I'm going to be preaching. I just, I just couldn't see not preaching this at the first service um, here when I'm going through all these doctrines is titled the main thing it's what it's all about it is, and it's basically about salvation once saved always saved eternal security easy believism whatever you want to call it you know what we believe about being saved is primary and is due to have preached first but what I want to preach on in the evening that's why I'm hoping you could you could stick around is the Godhead and what we believe about God and the Trinity because there's been a lot of, of false doctrine and heresy that's been going around and we have a brand new church and I just want to make sure that we're very clear on what we believe here with all of that that's been going around and I'm going to preach a sermon that um, I haven't heard a whole lot about I mean there's been some information put out there but tonight I'm going to be preaching on the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ so it's a very important doctrinal sermon so if you're able to stick around we'd love to have you stay here for that but let's dig into the sermon this sermon right now the main thing we, you know you've heard maybe you've heard before people say we got to keep the main thing Thing, the main thing right it's easy to get off track on a lot of different things when it comes to churches churches have a tendency to get off track doing all kinds of other activities and all kinds of other stuff and their focus ends up getting off what it's supposed to be on the focus the main focus the main point in our life in this church and and for born-again believers is to bring other people to Christ it's the Great Commission it's the gospel we're supposed to go out and preach the word and preach God's word and get other people people saved that's what it's all about that is the main thing but we need to make sure that we've got the main thing right <laughs> we got the right doctor when it goes out on preaching the gospel what is the gospel what is it that we believe now people ask me out soul winning very frequently i don't know what it's like here but i can't imagine it's that much different you run into a lot of people who are relatively ignorant when it comes to christianity and the bible and things like that and they have this real real vague kind of concept of what christianity is maybe they're catholic or maybe they have brought up some type of Christianity but they don't really know anything and one of the main questions I get is um, well what's the difference between Christian and Baptist or between Catholic and Baptist and it's kind of funny because when people ask well, what's the difference between Christian and Baptist they'll say hey I'm from a Baptist church you know I'm from strong old Baptist church they'll say well what what's the difference between Christian and Baptist well Baptist is Christian first of all we're, we're not like Catholic now there is a distinction where people would say well, are you Catholic or are you Christian and that for for decades that was a common question and it actually made sense because Catholics aren't Christian. I mean, it, they may claim to, to follow Christ or whatever, but, but they're really not. It's a false religion. But that is a common question that you'll probably get. That's a common question that I've always gotten is, well, what's the difference? And I always tell them, well, there may be many differences. There's a lot of little things that we can point to. And it's not that, the, not, it's not that any of those things are unimportant. You know, people have a lot of different beliefs. But the main thing and the main reason why I'm a Baptist, the main reason why I'm a pastor of a Baptist church, the reason why I call myself a Baptist, is because of salvation. It's because of what different churches and what people believe it takes to be saved. And I sum it up for the person, just say, you know, the vast majority of people out there, even those that call themselves Christian, whether it be non-denominational or Lutheran or Catholic or whatever, whatever denomination you want to put on it, the vast majority of churches out there are going to tell you to one degree or another that... In order to be saved and go to heaven, you have to be a good person. Is what it boils down to. They may tell you you have to believe in Jesus or go to church. You have to do all these other things in addition to believing. But you have to do more. That believing is not enough. And I explain to people, we don't believe that. We believe very specifically that salvation is a free gift and it's not of works. It has nothing to do with how good you are. Whether or not that means you have to be a certain, you know, good in order to get salvation or you have to be good after you get salvation in order to keep salvation. We don't believe in any of that works. 
that works are required at all. They are not. Salvation is completely free. It's a free gift. We started off reading here in Ephesians chapter number 2 because this is where we get what we believe about salvation not being of works. Now, this isn't the only passage, but this is a very clear passage in one where it's spelled out very, very clearly. Now, I'm going to mention this as well. When you go out and preach the gospel to people or talk to anybody for that matter, when it comes to scripture, when it comes to doctrine, we always want, if you're trying to convince somebody or persuade somebody, you want to start with using the most clear, concise verses that you can possibly find to teach on any given subject, no matter what it is. Now, we're talking about salvation specifically, and when it comes down to our works necessary, our works required, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 are extremely clear on this. You don't want to go to parables. You don't want to go to other passages where it could be easy to kind of misunderstand or misinterpret what the Bible's saying. We want to go to a passage that's going to be just very clear, black and white. There is no wiggle room or getting around what the Bible actually says. Look down there in verse number, um, well, look at, we're going to start reading verse number 5. It says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast. So what I love about this verse is very clear. Verse 8 is talking about being saved. It's talking about our salvation. Very clearly, it's spelled out in the first verse there, in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is something that's given to us that we don't deserve. It's undeserved. It's, a, it's like a gift, which is already mentioned in this verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is just what you believe. We're saved by God's grace. He's had mercy on us and extended grace unto us. And we're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's not based on us. It has nothing to do with us. It is the gift of God. It has nothing to do with how good we are. It's something that you receive for free. That's bought and paid for, given to you, not, and then we have verse 9, not of works. It cannot get any clearer than that. I mean, there, there is no way I think you could ever possibly word this understanding or the, you know, this thought than just clearly saying, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is no argument there. There should be no argument there. And these are the types of verses that we want to show to people. These are the verses that I like to use when I'm teaching a doctrine. This is what I like to use to prove, hey, this is why I believe what I believe. Because the Bible says right here, it is not of works. It is grace. It is through faith. It has nothing to do with me. It is a gift. It's something I receive for free. Now, you may have a lot of people that are going to say, oh, yeah, I believe that. I agree with that. Yet in their heart, they're still trusting in their works. The reason why is because this is so clear that even churches that teach a false gospel will still give lip service or say, hey, we believe salvation is by grace through faith. I mean, all the Reformed churches will say that. All, I mean, the vast majority of churches will say that. The vast majority. They're going to say that they believe that. But, they, but when it boils down to it, they really don't. Now, um, you may be thinking, you know, well, what, are you, what are you talking about, Pastor Burzins? I remember when I first got saved, I thought that there were a lot of people that were saved out there. I kind of felt like I joined the club. 
and you hear about you know Christianity. It's all these, and I didn't know much of anything about all the different denominations. But I just assumed that hey, well they're all Christian. I mean they're all believing in Christ. And I had the simplicity of the gospel of just hey, I just needed to put my faith in Christ as my Savior. And once I did that, I was you know I was it was amazing. I was just like wow, cool, I'm saved. This is awesome. But I didn't have a lot of knowledge when it came to all the different denominations. So for a long time, I just kind of had this belief that yeah, people believe some screwy things or, you know, like the Pentecostals or whatever. They kind of have some weird beliefs, but they're still believing in Christ. And I held that and maintained that thought. I mean, the only people I thought, I was like, oh man, they're just way screwed up would be like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons because it, it was pretty obvious they have another Jesus. I mean, they're, they, they were way, way, way too far out to even, for, for me, for, in my understanding, to see, yeah, they weren't, they're, they're not saved, but everyone else I thought was. It wasn't until I really started going out soul winning, and especially soul winning with someone who, who was really good at it, who was really good at getting the heart of the matter, before I started to realize, wow, there's actually not a lot of people that are saved. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is when you start digging people and asking a little bit more questions and actually doing a very thorough job of getting to the heart of the matter of what people believe, you'll start to realize that a lot of people don't actually believe this. Now we have to present God's word when you preach the gospel to people. It has to be there. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But what also needs to be there is a very proper and thorough explanation of these verses and just digging into it, similar to the way I, I was just doing. You go through the Word, say, it's for by grace. So, you know, when you're showing someone the Bible, take the time to explain, hey, grace means it's undeserved. Grace means it's not based on our works. He says it's through faith. It's what we believe. It has nothing to do with works or church attendance or anything like that. And go through each aspect of the verse and just explain it out thoroughly to make sure because just on a surface reading, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, I believe in that. But as you start getting in a little bit deeper, people might start to come up with an objection, at least in their own mind, if they don't verbalize it, saying, well, wait a minute, I don't actually believe that. And it gives you an opportunity to, um, to explain it even further. Now, um, when it says here, not of works, because people will try to pick these things apart. They say, well, what do you mean by works? What does the Bible mean by works? Because a lot of people say, well, I don't believe you have to work your way to heaven, but they'll still believe you have to obey the commandments. But, I mean, you can't do anything you want. You still have to obey, you know, God's rules for the most part. Well, when the Bible is talking about works, and I'm going to prove this to you, turn if you would to Romans chapter 9, when the Bible is talking about works, it's talking about the works of the law. It's talking about keeping the commandments of God. Those are the works. We're not talking about going out with a shovel and digging a ditch or like work in, in, in that sense. That's not what the Bible is referring to when it's, when it's explaining that, hey, it's not of works. And even in the context of Ephesians chapter 2, the very next verse explains, and I know I had you turn to Romans 9, say in Romans 9, verse number 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, a lot of people who believe a false gospel will point to this verse, and I have no problem with this verse. They're saying, see, what well, we're created unto good works. Okay, amen. We are created unto good works. We, we are supposed to. But the key word in that verse is should, that we should walk in them. We, of course we should. It doesn't mean you automatically will if you get saved, but see, that's what they try to say is that, oh, well, if you are saved, you will just automatically do all the good works. It's not true. We should. We should walk in those works. But it says we're his workmanship. He's worked through us and we are created unto good works, doing good things. And the way that we do good things is by the law. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse number 30. And you say, well, I don't understand because, I, you know, a lot of people think the law is, well, you shouldn't kill or you shouldn't steal. And yeah, those are part of the law. But say, what if I just, just help a lady across the street? Or what if I just help this person out or do that? Well, that's still encapsulated in, in the law, those things. It's not just a bunch of thou shalt nots in the law. The law actually has um, things that you're supposed to do and things you're not supposed to do. So when, is, when you're supposed to you know, love or treat your neighbor as yourself, 
That's still considered as part of the law. Look at Romans 9, verse number 30. The Bible says, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So there we have the phrase in verse number 32, the works of the law. Those are the good works. We have the, the Jews who thought they were going to achieve their salvation through their obedience to God's law. And the Bible's talking about that as being the works of the law. Keeping the, the sacrifices, keeping the commandments, keeping themselves, you know, supposedly keeping themselves pure. Obviously, they made excuses for any time they failed the law and still thought they were following the law. And you know what? That wasn't just specific with the Jews. People do that still today. Jews and Gentiles alike want to make excuses for why what they did really wasn't a sin or really wasn't that bad. And, and want to cover that up instead of just confessing or admitting, yeah, you know what, that is a sin. The Bible says in Galatians 2.16, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 4. You stay in Romans, turn to Romans 4. Galatians 2.16 says that knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. By the works of the law, by keeping God's law, nobody's justified. Let that sink in. And, and these are, again, Galatians 2.16, if you're taking notes, is another very clear verse to show somebody that it is not of works, that our salvation has not come through our working, our actions, our obedience to God's law. It does not come that way because no flesh is justified in the sight of God by our works. We all fall short. We all come short of the glory of God. So the next point I want to make is then is because people will, will follow this, this train of thought and say, well, is it possible to believe and not have works? And we just, we just experienced this on Wednesday with a, with a Catholic lady. And she's like, well, I know that the Bible says, you know, faith without works is dead. And they get that from James chapter 2, and I'll, I'll quote it for you. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? So you get some people that will, will say, Oh, yeah, of course we have to have faith. Of course it's by faith, and it's not of works. Right? They'll say that, and they'll agree. I think this lady even agreed to some extent, you know, uh, out loud. Now, some people you just can't convince, and you just have to be able to... to you know, after one and two admonitions, just reject and say, fine, you know, maybe another day. But um, there are some people who've just been a little bit deceived, and, and if they're having a good conversation with you, if, if they seem like they're receiving what you're saying, then you explain some of these things. The Bible says in James chapter 2, because most people just know, they'll say, well, faith without works is dead. And they've heard enough preaching just saying, oh, well, then if you don't have works and you don't have faith, you've never had faith and you're, never, and you're not saved. And they kind of tie all that stuff together into one thought that just, oh, well, since because the Bible says faith without works is dead, then automatically, if you're not doing good things, then you're not saved. And that's what they'll say. But they're, they're missing a lot of key uh, doctrines or points about salvation. One is the, it's eternal life. Once you receive eternal life, eternal means forever. I'm going to get into that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself with that. But... If you have very clear verses, like we already looked at, that it's not of works. And then we have one verse here that says, well, if you believe there's one God, and see some people, well, the devils believe, but they're not saved. Well, verse 19 in James 2 says that believing there's one God. Almost every religion believes there's one God. There's a few polytheistic religions out there that believe in multiplicities of gods. But believing in one God isn't what gets us saved anyways. So when someone throws that at you and says, well, the devils also believe, well, yeah, the devils believe there's one God. 
But the devils aren't putting their trust and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior to save them, and that's because that's what's necessary to be saved. Besides the fact that angels and devils, God doesn't deal with them the same way that He deals with human beings. We're different creatures. Just like God doesn't deal with human beings the same way He deals with animals and cows. I mean, they're different creations, they're different creatures. Angels were created to be ministers or ministering spirits, the Bible says. So, um, you know, there's nothing that talks about how they are to be saved. So, you know, you don't want to get too off on that type of subject, though, because the way that you could answer this with, with you know, answer this question, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? That's a question. Don't you, like, do you know that? Will you know that? Romans chapter 4 Verse number five explicitly says, there's a very good example of someone who doesn't work at all, but they do believe. Because they say, well, faith without works is dead. But what they mean by that is that basically it's not even possible to have faith without works. See, that's what they end up saying. And, and, and you should ask someone, well, is it even possible for a person to have faith and not have works? Because they'll probably say no if they're, if they're believing in this false gospel, if they're believing in works. Then you turn them to Romans 4 or 5 and say, well, the Bible says here, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. So does this person work? Do they do any good works? Because the Bible says here, this person works not. He doesn't do any good works. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So there you have it. An example of someone doing no good works, Yet they believe. They're saved. It says their faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And, and again, Romans 4 goes on to just explain that salvation has always been by grace through faith. It was by grace through faith when David was reigning. It was by grace through faith then when Abraham was around as well. Salvation's always been that way. We're not dispensationals in any way. And it's very clear here in Romans 4 saying, look, God is not going to impute. It says your iniquities are forgiven. Your sins are covered. It's done. It's paid for. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. He will not punish you or hold you responsible by sending you to hell for your sins. It's done. So not only do we have that verse that says, you know, him, him that worketh not... Is believing really enough? We get this question a lot as well. Is believing really enough? Like, I mean, come on. You can't tell me that, that you can just live however you want and still go to heaven and still be saved. Well, let's see what the Bible says. And I'm talking about clear verses. Acts chapter 16. You can turn there if you'd like. You probably know where I'm going. Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. These are all very common verses that we use out soul winning and for very good reason. I remember when I first went out soul winning, I, I kind of followed and copied uh, Pastor Anderson's pattern in the, in the verses that he would use. And um, I would spend a lot of time then as I was reading my Bible and studying and trying to find other verses to use. There's still a lot of verses that, that I use, and, and the method I use is still very, very close to what he uses. And for the, for the simple reason that the verses that are being used are extremely clear. There was a time where I started wanting to use, I was getting real excited about soul winning, and I was like, oh man, I want to use this verse, and this verse, and this verse, and I found out through practice that some of those verses weren't always the easiest to explain, even though they were rightly talking about salvation, they were very great verses, they were good doctrinally, they were right on, but they weren't always the easiest or the clearest to just get across to a person that's an unbeliever to show them just very simply, very straightforward, that this is all all it takes. Acts 16 verses 30 and 31 are verses that are very straightforward and clear on getting the message across on what it takes to be saved. Because people are saying, well, I don't know if, if believing is enough. Well, there's a man that asks the question in verse number 30. It says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's a great question. What do I have to do? What must I do? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. 
Now, I'll typically ask people, after reading this verse, I'll say, well, what, what does the Bible say that you have to do to be saved? And oftentimes they'll repeat what this says. They'll say, believe on Jesus. Sometimes they'll say something else. They'll say, well, you got to go to church. You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. And I'll say, well, is, is that what the Bible says? So no. Look at, look at what the words actually say because that's what matters. Not what you've been taught. Not what you think. What it says. And then you could use this verse to say, well... They say, oh, well, you're just, you're just looking at one verse. Okay, we are. We're, well, we're looking at two. There's two verses. But let's say that there's something else that needs to be done. Maybe, maybe the Bible says somewhere else that you need to do something other than believe on Jesus to be saved. Wouldn't they be lying to this person then? Because what they said in their answer was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's a very clear sentence, a very clear statement. He asked the question, they gave the answer, he said, It's believe on Jesus. If there is anything else that you had to do, then they gave him a wrong answer. It's a lie. And then you have to ask, well, is, is this a lie? I mean, is this... It's written in God's Word. It's recorded. It's the Apostle Paul and Silas. Did this guy not get saved? Because they went back and they baptized him in his whole house for believing. Very, very clear verse. Just like John 3.16, John 3.18, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.18, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why he's not saved, because he didn't believe. This person is saved, they're not condemned, they're not guilty because he believed. The other person, they are condemned because they have not believed. Very simple, very straightforward verses. These are the verses that we want to use. These are the verses that I love to use when explaining salvation because it is that critical. Well, what about repenting? A lot of people say, well, you have to repent of your sins. You have to, you know, you have to believe and repent. Believe and repent. And they'll say, these two things go together. You can't tie them apart. You can't do it. You know, believe and repent. But see, the problem is what they say, and this could go an entire sermon of its own, but the vast majority of people, when they say you have to repent, they just add repent of your sins or they automatically think that that's what it means. You have to repent of your sins. You have to turn from your sins. You have to repent of your sins. Let me tell you, the word repent all by itself does not mean turn from your sins. Not at all. The easiest way, the easiest definition I can tell you what the word repent means is just rethink. The word pent is, is, the, is the root word for, for thinking. Um, you know, I believe it comes from Latin, but uh, regardless, if you know any Spanish, you know pensar means to think. It's the same, again, the same root word where the word comes from. Repent just means you're rethinking something. You're changing your mind. That's what the word repent means. If it had anything, if it inherently was talking about sin, like turning from your sins, well, then that would make God a sinner because God repents in the Old Testament. You can see God repenting. It says, even in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10, the Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil they thought to do unto them. So God repented. God was going to destroy Nineveh. But he changed his mind when he saw their works. So the Bible says, it. Jonah 3.10, write that down if you don't ever use that. When you come across someone who, who says, no, you have to repent of your sins, go to Jonah 3.10. It has all that you need. It's very clear and very concise to prove that person does not have to turn from their sins in order to be saved. Because one, it shows that God repents, so you can you immediately just destroy their definition of the word repent. So was well, God a sinner? Did God have to repent of any sin? No, he doesn't. Because that's an important point to get across because people just hear the word repent and they just automatically in their mind are going to add of your sin, of your sin, of your sin. It's not of your sin in every case. You can't understand the Bible with that, with that definition of repent. You're, you're going to be all screwed up. 
So one, it shows that the definition is different, but two, it shows then and defines that if you're turning from your evil way or turning from your sin, it's works. So the Bible says God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. Turning from your wicked way. So I'll say, well, well, is repenting of your sin the same as turning from your wicked way? Yeah, it is. And the Bible defines that as works. Why? See, people use this phrase, oh, you're turning from your sin to the Savior. But that's not, what, that's not, that doesn't even make any sense. Because if you're turning from your sins, and look, we all, we all ought to turn from our sins. I believe in this. I believe in turning from your sins, but not in order to be saved. If you turn from your sins, what's going to happen as a result is you are going to be obeying God's law. Because what is it that's making you sin? It's God's, you know, it's, it's your lack of obedience to God's law. That's what's making you a sinner. You're not obeying God's law, therefore you're sinning. So when you turn from not obeying God's law, you're going to turn to obeying God's law. That's how you turn from your sins. So if you have to turn from your sins to be saved, then what you're saying is you have to obey God's law in order to be saved. That's the works of the law, which we already showed are not a requirement for our salvation. But it's a, it's a very big, uh, very, a lot of brainwashing going on out there about turning from your sins to be saved. But if you could break it down for, if you find someone that's willing to listen, you could break it down for them. Because one of the, the most important things we can do in giving the gospel is just break things down very simple, very easy to be understood, and use the verses that are clear. Jonah 3.10, there's no doubt about what it's saying. People might reject it because they don't like what it says. But what it actually says is clear. It defines turning from evil uh, as works, turning from wicked ways as works. Since salvation is not determined by our good works, we've already established that, and only by our faith, the next thing is, is then, well, how can our bad works take away our salvation? Because some people will say, oh no, salvation is a free gift, it's completely by grace through faith, you know, you just have to receive it, believe in Christ, and you're saved. But then they'll say, but, but... I mean, if you commit murder, if you don't follow the me, if you don't, then God's going to take that gift away from you, and then you're not saved anymore. See, there's all different ways that people will try to, to back in works into the equation. Instead of just accepting that it's totally free and bought and paid for, and once you receive it, it's yours. Because they'll say murder or suicide. Well, if it wasn't based on our good works, then how can our bad works take it away? It doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I didn't deserve salvation when I got saved, when I was 20 years old. Didn't deserve it. I was a sinner. I don't deserve it. But guess what? I did get saved. I'm 41 years old today. I still don't deserve salvation. I'm not going to deserve salvation tomorrow or in a year or in 10 years. I, I don't deserve it. I'm still a sinner. I don't deserve it. I'll never deserve it. So it's not based, me keeping salvation has nothing to do with being good enough because I'm not good enough. Nobody's good enough. That's why it has nothing, that's why Ephesians 2 says not of yourselves, like not of yourselves at all. Not to receive it, not to keep it, not to maintain it. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with Jesus and what he did. Because he gets all the credit and all the glory and all the honor. I don't get none of it. It doesn't matter how much I clean up my life. I still am not worthy of having that great gift. But Jesus was worthy. And all the direction, all the attention goes to him. If I never deserve the gift to begin with, how can I undeserve it later? That, again, it doesn't make sense. We can't lose it. We do believe in once saved, always saved. Once you receive salvation, you are saved forever. 
Now, when you say that to people, oftentimes what people get confused with is they'll say, whoa, so you're Calvinist. Because Calvinists will use that term. They'll say, they're one saved, always saved. Or, or you know, but I always make sure that I'm clear. We're not Calvinist. And uh, if you're not familiar with Calvinism, don't worry about it. It's just, it's just a heretical false doctrine. But um, basically, they believe one of the things, they, they have an acronym, it's called TULIP, and, and, and each letter stands for one point of their doctrine, of this, this, uh, this doctrine that John Calvin came up with. He didn't come up with the acronym, but it's basically the same belief. And the, the P part of their, what they believe is the perseverance of the saints. So one of the things that they believe in once saved, always saved, and th their version of once saved, always saved, is that if you're saved, you will persevere unto the end, meaning that you will just live, you know, this life, and you'll, you'll be, you know, you're not going to be perfect, but you will continue to persevere in the faith and your works and everything else, that if you don't actually kind of live up to what a saved person should be, then you were never saved to begin with. That is not what we believe. Again, because your works don't determine even if you were saved or not. Your works don't determine that. It's your faith. Whether or not you put your trust in Christ. Because, let's face it, we all have this flesh. And we all have free will. I, myself, tomorrow can choose, or today, right now, I can choose to just start walking in my flesh and say, you know what? I'm fed up with this. I'm tired. It's too hard. I'm just going to go back off into the world and just live a worldly lifestyle and go off and party and drink and do drugs and do whatever feels good and ruin and destroy and waste my life. But that wouldn't change what happened when I was born again. That wouldn't change the fact that Christ already paid for my sins and has given me a free gift. None of that would change that. So we don't believe that it's an automatic thing that the saints will persevere unto the end. But what we do believe in that starts with a P is preservation. We believe that God will preserve our souls. He preser Once he saves us, we are preserved forever. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and Psalm 97 both spell this out very clearly. The, the preservation of the saints as opposed to the perseverance of the saints. Now don't let, because in both Psalm 37 and both uh, Psalm 97, the word saint is used. And sometimes the word saint can throw people off because, again, the Catholics have this perception or teaching of what a saint is. And they don't call someone a saint unless they've done all these good works and stuff and they have to vote on it or however they go through their process of someone who's achieved sainthood based on their works. That is not a biblical definition of a saint. The word saint just means someone who is sanctified. That's where the, the two words come from the same root. So someone who's sanctified is someone who is sanctified through Christ. Basically, you're cleansed or you're washed through Jesus Christ. He has sanctified us from our sins. He's cleansed us. He's sanctified us. So we are saints. Every believer is a saint because you've been sanctified. So that's the biblical definition of what a saint is. So when you see the word saint, you don't have to think, oh, it's someone who does all these great works because it's not. It's someone who's a believer who's been sanctified or set apart because Christ has paid for all their sins. Psalm 37, verse number 28, the Bible says, For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. God's not going to forsake you. Just like it says in Hebrews, you know, Lord, that, that God will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise from God. God doesn't back out of his promises. He will never turn his back on us. Even if you turn your back on him, he won't turn his back on you. He won't forsake you. 
Now, if you remember, Jesus Christ was forsaken. The famous verse, you know, the famous statement he made on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, why was it that Jesus was forsaken? Because, first of all, when anyone dies in their sins, they are forsaken of the Lord. They are rejected. And since Jesus Christ came to pay for the penalty for our sins, when he was on that cross, when he bare the sins of the whole world on the tree, when he was up on that cross, and he took our sins on himself in order to pay for those sins, he had to be forsaken, he had to be rejected, his soul went to hell before rising again from the dead. Because he paid for all of our sins. So he was forsaken. But because he did that, because he was forsaken for us, we will never be forsaken of the Lord. We're preserved forever through the gift that he gave us, through what he did for us. Psalm 97.10 basically is going to teach us the same exact doctrine. Psalm 97, verse number 10. The Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. Again, teaching that our souls are preserved. You don't have to persevere for your soul to be preserved. God does the preservation. It's not left up to us. We are sealed. Ephesians chapter 1 shows us that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, this is actually the verse that I used on the, on the front of our tracts that we would give out at Word of Truth Baptist Church. Not only does it have Word of Truth in there, but it's a, a great salvation verse. It's very, very useful when going out and preaching the gospel to people. Verse number 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, so it's talking about trusting in Jesus after you've heard the gospel, right? In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. We're not Calvinists. We don't believe in the perseverance of the saints. But we believe in preservation. But when we believe that we are saved forever we have eternal security we are secure in our salvation and this is one more passage that explains that why because god has set a seal on us once you believe once you make the decision make the choice to trust in jesus christ with all of your heart that he is your savior then god seals you and what it what it refers to it as it says it's the earnest of our inheritance we're going to receive an inheritance later. But the moment you believe, you're sealed. And there's a down payment kind of, you know, put down. Where God gives you the earnest of the Spirit. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. The purchased possession is us in full. Our bodies, everything. God has bought us with a price. He's purchased us. With the blood of Jesus Christ, we are bought and paid for. We belong to Him. So once we put our faith in Him, we belong to Him, He seals us, and He gives us that Spirit as the down payment saying, I'm going to come back for the rest. So when Jesus Christ comes back, then our bodies are changed, we're reunited with our soul, spirit, body, everything, back in one, glorified, and we belong to God. It says, unto the praise of His glory. So if you go to John 5, 24. John 5.24, very, very rare that I ever give the gospel to anybody without turning to John 5.24. This is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I think it's extremely powerful. We sang that song this morning, Verily, Verily. Comes from this verse. John 5, 24, Jesus Christ speaking, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And one of the things I like to point out about this verse when I'm preaching the gospel is that there's three verb tenses used in this one verse. It's got the present, the past, and the future. 
So when it says you believe on him, that's something he says you hath everlasting. Hath is present tense. It means you have it right now. Something that you get immediately. Right now, I have everlasting life. So I'm good right now. And then he says, and shall not come into condemnation. That's future tense. So not only do you have everlasting life right now, you shall not come into condemnation in future, but is past from death unto life. It's already happened. It's already done. Because you believe, the moment you believe, you've passed from death unto life. You're headed towards death as a sinner. You believe in Jesus. That's, that's the line mark. If you have a timeline of your life from birth until death, you're living your life, you're living your life. As soon as you believe in Jesus, boom, that's the moment you've passed from death unto life. It's done. It's paid for. And from that moment, you have everlasting life. And because you have everlasting life, it lasts forever, so you shall not come into condemnation at any point in the future ever because you have everlasting life and it lasts forever. You cannot lose that. It can't be taken away. It is eternal. The words eternal and everlasting mean forever. Turn, if you would, to... Um, just flip over to John chapter 10. We're here in John 5. We're going to spend the rest of our time probably here in John. John chapter 10, verse number 28. And again, if you want to take notes of any of these verses, if, these, if these, any of these verses aren't ones that you normally use out soul winning, you may want to make a note of them and maybe you want to kind of incorporate them if you think that makes sense. There's always... Um, People that get hung up on different things, different, different issues that they struggle with on, on understanding the gospel. And it's good to have extra verses to help explain what you're trying to explain to them. John chapter 10, verse number 28, the Bible reads, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Very clearly he says, I give. It's a gift. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So when Jesus gives you eternal life, are you ever going to perish? No. What does perish mean? To die. Now physically we know we're going to die, but this body isn't just all of who we are. We have a soul and a spirit, and who we really are is what's on the inside. That's what makes us who we are. So when this body passes away, we don't die. We don't perish. We still continue. We still exist. We have eternal life. And when it says, no man, any man can pluck them out of my hand, no, no man includes yourself. You can't pluck yourself out of God's hand. And God's not going to let go because he's not going to forsake us. We've already seen that. The Lord is faithful. He cannot break his promises. This is why we're so solid on our salvation. Because God cannot lie. Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God made a, when God makes promises, he, can't, he cannot back down. Man, let man, let, let uh, God be true, but every man a liar. Any man can tell a lie. Every man can tell a lie and has told lies. But God never lies. That's, he's holy. He can't lie. It's not in his nature. He cannot tell a lie. So when God says something, we can be sure. He's proved himself over and over and over again through all of his words. He always rings true with his promises. So if he promises eternal life, if he promises that you'll, you'll live forever, if he promises he'll never forsake you, then we can trust that with, with more trust than anything else that we have in our entire lives. And once you're born, you cannot be unborn. I'm going to hit this last point real quick. John chapter 3. You flip over John chapter 3. I found that this illustration that God has given us in the Bible about being born again is very useful for people to understand the concept of salvation. The concept of being able to be saved and never have to worry about being unsaved. The concept that it's completely free. And 
There's other illustrations that I use, but this one especially, especially when it comes to people, um, moms are probably the, the, the easiest to, to grasp this concept. But I mean, anyone really can, but it really hits home with people who have children. It's about being born again. So let's read here in John chapter 3 what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He says in verse number 3, Jesus answered and said, Unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, well, you want to go to heaven? You want to see the kingdom of God? Well, you've got to be born again. You cannot go unless you're born again. Right? Very clearly. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. He's like, wait a minute. I don't see how this is going to work, Jesus. I'm a grown man, okay? I mean, like in my case, I'm bigger than my own mom. All right, there's no way I'm going to go back in my mother's womb and she's going to give birth to me again. It can't happen, right? Obviously, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But Jesus explains himself. Verse number five, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is flesh is spirit. So he's, he's talking about it's a spiritual birth. There is a spiritual birth that takes place the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Your spirit is born again. John chapter 1, you just flip back to John 1, 12, because the Bible explains it right there. And, it, and this is another very clear verse because it's one thing to say, okay, well, we need to be born again. So, and then he says, well, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So, of course, physically we have a birth. We need the spiritual birth. But then, but how exactly do we do that? John 1, 12 explains that. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when you become a son of God, well, if you're becoming a son, it means you're born, right? You're born into a family. When we are born into God's family, it's when we receive Christ. It's when we believe on his name. We become a child of God. We become born again. That spirit is born within us. And the reason why I said that I think a lot of women have, have a better time, especially moms, have a really good time understanding this, is because then I go through and explain, you know, being a parent and having a child and having a son that's born to you. You say, you know what, do you have, do you have rules for your child? Of course. Why do you have rules for your child? Why don't you just let them do whatever they want? Well, because they need instruction, right? They need guidance. They need to be taught right from wrong. You want them to grow up and do what's right. You want them to be a good person when they grow up. You don't want to, to create some monster, some, some horrible person. So they need to have rules. They need to have discipline. But I'll tell you what, no matter what your child does, does that mean, if, if they do something real bad, does that mean you don't love them anymore? Of course not. Well, parents say, no. I mean, I love, I love my child no matter what. There's an unconditional love that parents have for their children from the moment that they're born. I remember the moment my first child was born, and I looked down, and there's a feeling I've never had in my life of just this unconditional love for your own child. And God has created us with that inherently as part of his creation that gives us even more understanding of what it means to be a child of God. Because just as much as my child, I love my child no matter what. God loves all of his children. Now, he has rules for us just as I have rules for my children. And when my children break my rules, they get punished. They get disciplined. Well, God disciplines his children also. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you just go off and do whatever you want and there's no consequences. No, God's not a deadbeat father, okay? God, God is, a, is a very good father and a very loving father, and he's not going to want you to get off track, so he will discipline you. But just as much as I'm not going to take any of my children, no matter what they do, and put them in my oven and turn it on broil and lock it up and just leave them in there, God won't do that to his children either. Because what, that's what hell is. There's nothing my children could do to be, you know, no longer my children. Now, I know in this world, you might, you know, some kid might get kicked out of their home and just not able to live there. 
But in their blood, in their DNA, they're still a child of their parent. Nothing can change that. that is, and, and, you know, we live in an imperfect world. But God is perfect. And with God, when we're born of His seed, of the Word of God, that seed remains in us and doesn't go away. And just as much as our DNA, my DNA is in, is in my children, you know, God's Word is in us. God's seed is in us. He sealed us with the Spirit. We cannot break that bond. We are always His children. And when we take our last breath, whether a good child or a bad child, we all get to go home to be with God. And that is a concept that many people, especially those who have children, can really relate to and grasp and understand and say, yes, I get it. Yes, that's what, you know, that makes sense to me. And God gives us these, you know, these ways of understanding so that we can grasp it and get it. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. And, and he want, God, you know, God wants everyone to be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's given us the opportunity. He's given us the information. He's even instilled in us that concept of, of, of having children and knowing what that's like and knowing the love of a father, the love of a mother. And he relates that to our salvation because that's what our salvation is like. It is forever. It is eternal. Galatians 4 is the last place I'm going to look at this, this afternoon. I'm going to close with this. Galatians chapter 4. Again, and just in reference to being a child of God or being a son. Galatians 4, verse number 4. The Bible reads, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. As a child, as a son, now because we're in the family, there is an inheritance. Inheritances are received only by the family members, typically, right? You're, you're, an inheritance is passed on from father to son. We have an inheritance in heaven with God through Jesus Christ. Because He is who made it possible for us to be saved, to be adopted children, to be brought into God's family. That heir, that, you know, there's, there's so many things that the Bible relates and helps relate to us of what salvation is and, and to help us understand this. It's a very important doctrine. You know, I, I may not appreciate anything new necessarily to you here to, uh, today, but we need to have this reinforced. And hopefully you got maybe a few extra scriptural references that you can use or tips on going out and, and preaching the gospel to people. But um, th this is the most important doctrine and the primary thing, what we're all about. So it, it only makes sense to preach that first and just make sure we're all on the same page. This is what salvation is. And let's go out this afternoon and, and bring this good doctrine out to the people out there, out to the lost world, and see how many souls we can save. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for the free gift of salvation, for just allowing us to be totally secure and, and know that we're saved no matter what because you bought and paid for our salvation, dear Lord. Um, we thank you for such a, a great gift, and I pray that you please help us to be able to explain. It's an easy concept. It's not difficult, dear Lord, but so many people have been twisted around with bad doctrine and bad teachings, dear Lord, and um, I pray that you please help us to undo some of that damage and just bring the truth to people and that they would have the best chance that they could to just understand what the gospel is and what you've done for them and that we can uh, help bring those people to Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.